What are 10 things that you can do with the Psy D in clinical psychology? Stick around, let's talk about it today in this episode of Navigating Academia. What's up, Navigating Academia family? This is your buddy and personal academic mentor, Dr. Jay Phoenix Singh, as well as your resident psychologist. Super excited to be able to speak with you today. We'll make this a brief little video because we're basically gonna go down the line of 10 things that you can do with a PsyD. That not only do I know for a fact you can do, many of these I have done, and if I haven't done them directly, I have many dozens of friends and colleagues and former students who now have gone into this and are absolutely loving their lives. You know, if you do consultation with me. If you ever want to you know, work one-on-one -on -one for me to help you get into grad school, help review and revise your materials, you can go ahead, pop down here to gradschoolapplicationcoach.com. But I will tell you right now that oftentimes I will see in these personal statements, people's near-term and long-term goals. And a lot of these things that we're going to be talking about today, which are genuine opportunities of things you can do with this ID degree, these are often on there. So let's go ahead and pound right through, okay? So number one is to be able to open a private practice. A lot of people, when they get into psychology, this is the dream. In their head, they have this vision of them being a little Sigmund Freud with as much hair as me and essentially sitting there with the glasses down to here, right? And maybe, I don't know, a blazer with some little pads right on the elbows, sitting down and there being a patient lying on a couch with a carpet on top of it and having a conversation with them. Now, it in a contemporary clinical setting, that happens very rarely, maybe for a classical psychoanalyst, something like this, but usually not. But regardless, people like the idea, they have this entrepreneurial spirit, they want to start a private practice. If you ever want to start a private practice, again, make sure that you talk to me first, because we gotta talk about the practical reality of that. The fact that you're working for yourself means that you have to pay your own payroll taxes, you gotta pay rent, you gotta pay malpractice insurance, you gotta pay for utilities, you gotta rent an actual place, you gotta pay for sales and marketing efforts and digital marketing. Marketing, you gotta build up a social media presence, you gotta get out there in the community. There's so many factors you need to take into consideration. So if you ever wanna open a private practice, we gotta talk about that. You guys know me, I'm a big finance guy, so because of that, financial planning, especially financial budgeting from the jump, let me tell you, this is gonna help you out a ton. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is that you can work in a hospital, hospital or a clinic, depending on where you live. I had a wonderful client I was speaking with yesterday in a one-on-one -on -one consult session. She was talking to me about the importance of accessible mental health care. Why did she care so deeply about that? She cared about it because there was only one hospital that was in her rural region, right, of a Midwestern state in the United States. Uh, and that hospital did not have any kind of mental health care services that was there. They had one social worker who had had minimal training, right, in contemporary mental health care. Uh, and it was one of those situations where there just weren't a lot of resources available. Now, in this day and age, we've got telemental health and this kind of stuff, which is great. But individuals going through some of the toughest times of their lives are going to be in hospitals. And it is a blessing for you to be able to provide them with the care that they need, not just to themselves, but also to their families in many cases as well. It's very important, guys. Okay, it's number two. Number three is to work in a school. Everybody had school counselors. I had Mrs. Duvall. I, Mrs. Duvall was the ish. She was amazing. This is me in elementary school. I got bullied so bad in elementary school because I was a really, really chubby kid. It sucked. But let me tell you that having that school psychologist there was a huge, huge blessing. Taught me so much. And it ended up being a positive experience by you know the end of sixth grade, which in the United States is when you end up graduating from uh, elementary school. Some schools, a little bit different, I suppose, but for the most part in the States, at least in Virginia where I grew up, that's what you end up seeing, okay? But in that case, obviously, you're dealing a lot with the administration, you're dealing a lot with students, you're dealing a lot with parents, which can be very difficult sometimes, as you can imagine, okay? So, it's a very demanding job, but at the same time, if it's something where you really wanna work in a developmental or a family setting, Really good choice for you, okay, that's number three. Number four is to be able to work at a prison. This is me, right, being a forensic psychologist. I used to work in the only psychopath and serial killer unit uh, in the country of Switzerland. Uh, and it was a situation we could talk about some other time. If you guys are interested in hearing about it, let me know in the comments below. But working in a prison is a very, very unique experience. You need to be able to make sure that you have particular clinical expertise and evidence-based knowledge expertise in a very unique set 
of clinical phenomena, I'll tell you that right now. Uh, and these are things that you can learn in a clinical psychology program which have a special, which has a specialization in forensic psychology. Or even if you don't, when you graduate, you can get really in to that sub-literature and get training from groups like my old group, which was called the Global Institute of Forensic Research. You can still check them out, it's gifrinc.com. If you want continuing professional development credit and to get certifications in forensic psychology, it is the number one place on the internet was such an honor to be able to start and significantly scale that organization. That's number four. Number five is to work with sports teams. My number one mentor in the world is this guy named Stahl Bjorkley, who's in Norway. Stahl will never see this, but if he did, I love you to death. Right, been there for me through it all, through it all since I was 20 years old, amazing. So 20 years-ish, right, amazing. Um, and I'll tell you that one of the things that he does, and he absolutely loves it, is that he works with his local football team. Football over there in Norway, obviously meaning soccer to Americans, right? Uh, and he actually used to play for the soccer team. And what he does is a pro bono service, is he goes down and he works uh, with these athletes. Why? Because a lot of them have performance anxiety or any kind of anxiety about what's going on, and it significantly impacts their ability to work with their teammates. Speaking of which, some of these folks end up coming from different countries. They have different cultural backgrounds. It's hard to be able to get that group cohesion. You as a psychologist can help with that. What a blessing, right? Number six, you can do something else that I did, which was to become a university professor. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be on a tenure track. It could be something where you have a contract basis, where every three years or so you get a new contract. Uh, maybe you're getting paid to teach per course, like the average adjunct professor, whatever it happens to be. But it's definitely something that's very fulfilling, especially if you like working with young people and pedagogy is something that you care about very deeply. So that's number six. Number seven is participating in research. Regardless of whether you're a professor or not, uh, you know, number eight here, so maybe I'll combine these two, is going into an industry position. I have a lot of colleagues who work for things like think tanks uh, or, you know, just for private companies which are developing new everything, products and services, and they want to be able to test the efficacy of these things, and oftentimes they want to publish the findings in peer-reviewed journals and other peer-reviewed outlets, like, go, for example, going to conference uh, conferences and giving paper and poster presentations. This is something that you can easily, with this ID, get interested in and get involved with, okay? Number nine is to be able to provide expert testimony. Usually, I will say that this ties in with being a forensic psychologist, because usually, as a forensic psychologist, you're doing things like mental state examinations, jury decision making, uh, police interrogation stuff, all of these things. What I do, which is violence risk assessment predictions, uh, which oftentimes influence sentencing or civil commitment, which is like involuntary commitment to psychiatric hospitals, these sorts of things. This is all kind of within one, uh, one big stirred pot, and expert testimony is a piece there as well. You can actually get paid quite well per testimony, but it takes a lot of networking with different judges, different lawyers, and so forth. So again, if you're a little bit introverted, trust me on this one. I totally get it. Important to be able to see how we can address that, to be able to keep the ball rolling, make sure you have a terrific experience in your field, okay? Finally, number 10 is opening or working for a mental health care nonprofit, or frankly, any kind of healthcare related nonprofit. Uh, this is such a blessing. I have so many of my friends who this is what they did. They worked and ended up getting their PsyD, and then after that, they went out into the workplace, said, you know what? I don't really like having a private practice. Went into industry. You know what? I don't like this. They ended up at what we call in America 501c3, which is a nonprofit, and they are absolutely joyous. They feel like they're making a significant impact on people's lives. They can see it on the day to day. They're working with stakeholders in the community and organizations that are equally as passionate as they are. It's fantastic. So those are the 10 things or 10 examples of things you can do with this ID. If you want to learn how to get into the top PsyD programs, particularly ones that are fully funded, which are the hardest ones to get into in the United States and Canada, I want you to hit me up down here, right? Which is gradschoolapplicationcoach.com and we can work through all of your materials to be able to make sure that you have a maximum shot of getting in. I've gotten over 80% success rate of getting individuals into their target programs because I've been doing this for a long time, all right? And I know every tip and, trip in the book, tip and trick in the book to be able to help you guys out. So with that said, thank you guys so much for watching. Smash that like button, subscribe to the channel. If you liked this content, we have hundreds of videos just like it, and I will see you guys in the next one. Peace. Thank you so much for stopping by everyone. It's a pleasure to have you here as always. If you enjoyed this video and you'd like to see more in this series on navigating academia, please click on one of these links over here to be able to view more original content. I hope to see you there.